Greetings everyone, welcome to another episode of The Professionals You Should Know. This show is about uncovering the journeys of professionals from different industries. And today, we have the resourceful and aspirational Asha McKenzie, who is a commercial pilot. So, it's a pleasure having you here today. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so, what is it that you do? So, I am a qualified commercial pilot. Wow. How did you become a pilot? What's your journey? <laughs> what did you do? How... Uh, I think essentially the key things that you need, mm. um, especially you want to fly for an airline, is an airline transport pilot's license. So right. it's an ATPL. Oh. So there's different routes into uh, into that. Yeah. You can do it modular way where you break it down, sort of pay as you go. Or you could do a full-time course, which is an integrated route okay. and it takes you from zero all the way up to airline qualified how long does it take <laughs> <Bro>. <laughs> i mean how long did it take me if you come from um a, a, a background where you have access to a lot of money really you can do it in the space of about i'll say 18 months to two years if you really? do it to, but for most people Finance can be a bit of a challenge and it will take you a little bit longer. So is it really expensive? Yeah Yeah, so really? to do the full course um, you're looking in the region of at the cheapest end. It's about 65,000 65, at the most expensive oh. end. It's about 150 K. So averaging about 100 K for your training. Whoa yeah. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. Do you know, I throw these numbers up there now because I'm used to hearing them, but like, I know it's, it's yeah. So my, my course was eighty nine thousand nine hundred and eighty pounds. Jeez. It's imprinted in my mind that figure. I can't get it out of my head. Um, but over yeah. the span of how long? How long did? How how long did you train? So, how long did it take you? What was your journey? For me, I'm one of those, it sounds a bit cliche, but I'm one of those kids that I wanted to fly for when I was young. So yeah. my parents told me I was about six years old right. when I first started talking about flying. Yeah. But obviously when you grow up, I grew up in Hackney. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. when you're from Hackney, <laughs> a black boy from Hackney, that's, that's not a realistic dream, you know. And I remember people used to laugh at me when I would tell them I wanted to do it. But it never left me. And I tried. I tried my best to do little lessons here and there, go through the cadets and things. But, oh, yeah. um, and I thought at some point, you know, if I work really hard, I get good grades, I'll get a scholarship or something yeah, and I yeah. won't worry about the money. But, you know, it got to a place where I had to try and make it work. So I did the A-levels that they tell you you should really do oh. maths and physics. Yeah, yeah. Which you don't actually yeah, okay. have to do. I wish someone told me <laughs> earlier about maths and physics. I went and I did a degree in aeronautical technology with pilot studies. Right. I trained in the Royal Air Force when I was with them, um, which is good. So they paid for some of my flying when I was at uni. But right. when I left, I still had a bill of about a hundred and odd thousand pounds. So I, I went away, I worked, wow. I tried to save up. So I, at all this point, you wasn't, you still didn't become a pilot? No, the, the pro, the, the, I think the problem you have mm. is, what is a pilot? Yeah, all right. Because <laughs> yeah, right. right. what, right. what, right. what is a pilot? Yeah, because right. if you have like a, a, a private pilot's license and you just fly a little two-seater plane somewhere, yeah. does that mean you're not a real pilot? Right. Or you okay. are? So enough. I, I flew when I was 13 years old. That's the first time I ever flew a plane. I was 13. My mum got me this uh, flying lesson for my birthday. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. <laughs> I, was, I was hooked. She, I remember I was in the plane. The instructor was like, do you want to have a go? I'm thinking, no way. We're gonna, I don't want to crash this. She said, no, no, give it a go. I flew around and I was buzzing. Like, I, I, again, it was like, what, 150 pounds or something, yeah. a lesson. So I, I did like little runs mm -hmm. and stuff to fund it, but it was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't keep that up. So yeah. I didn't really fly properly again until I got to university. Okay. You know, I picked this degree. It was like aeronautical technology or pilot studies. I thought, yeah, student loan will cover it. Yeah. Learn to read the small print. <laughs> That's why I learned to read the fine print. So it, it, it covers everything other than the practical side. So there was quite a few of us on the course oh. that, you know, we didn't have the money to do it. And that's when I applied for this program, the RAF, and the Royal, which is the Royal Air Force. Okay. I got on there and they paid for some of my training. So what did you do in uni then? What was the, so, is it that theory based? 
the, the, my course was, at the time, it was quite an unusual course. There were only about three or four universities that offered the program because in the UK, it's all engineering. It's like yeah. aeronautical engineering, aerospace engineering. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't much aeronautical technology, which looks more at the science behind the aircraft. Um, How does okay. it fly? Why does it do what it does? Um, and then you have practical modules in there. Right. So I was very lucky. I say well, I was blessed to have made it onto the RAF program. Yeah. The only person that looked like me, <laughs> I, I mean, on this, you know, it was it was an interesting experience. Yeah, um, but um, that that gave me a good insight and a good sort of foundation. We've done a lot of aerobatics flying and formation. Oh, so we take a plane and flip it upside down. Oh, sorry, obviously, when I was when I was doing the RAF, so I th it was the best thing I've done Seriously. in my life. You you have a normal lesson where they'll teach you sort of basics and fundamentals of flying, and say a lesson is supposed to be an hour and a half. You right. might finish the lesson in say an hour. Okay. The instructor will turn to you and be like, you know, you've got half an hour to kill. Do you want to do some? Aer 100% now we've really? got upside down and bow rolls and stool turns and they're all ex-fighter pilots so you, you know so they get, are they the ones that like go really really fast well I mean <laughs> the aircraft we were flying didn't go that fast but, but, but they were fully aerobatic so you spent a lot of time sort of upside down and in turns and spins and flying in formation where you have maybe three or four planes all alongside oh, each other okay. um yeah it was good fun it was good fun but at the end of it i only i graduated with a degree and not licenses so i had a lot of knowledge but uh, to do your light to fly for an airline you need the atpl the airline transport pilot's license so okay it was a few years before i managed to get that license as well so uh, working alongside the raf when you was when you did you get a job in the raf or it was just so, a <laughs> <laughs> See, so my, my friends laugh at me. They say my, my life is a bit like a Netflix series because nothing ever goes exactly to plan. Right. So I got on a program um, on a university air squadron. So you basically, uh, you're employed as a RAF reservist. So okay. it means they can't call upon you to go to war or something. So as much as you're training oh, with them, they do a full okay. training program with you, but you're not in the mainstream RAF. So my intention was when I graduated from university, go into the mainstream RAF, yeah, right. fly that way. Yeah. Because they pay for all your flight yeah, training, yeah. like, you know, good experience. But just as I came to the end of my course, they had what was called um, a defense strategic review. Right. And they axed about 400 oh, pilot jobs. Oh, they it, it, it all closed up. So um, our superiors are like, you know, it doesn't make sense you waiting around right. because there won't be any flying jobs for the next few years. Right. Just go out into the big bad world, see if you can find something in civvy life. But, yeah. you know, I applied for some programs. I right. got onto certain programs, yeah. but when I saw 100, 110,000, <laughs> I was like, you know, it's for the experience. Just take the assessment for the experience, you know. But um, so I went away. Um, I worked at British Airways for oh, really? about a few years. Um, so I joined this cabin crew. Right. Um, amazing. Yeah. Like, honestly, I was, do you know, I, I, I didn't know that you could have so much fun in one job. Literally, mm. you, they, you, you're getting paid to go on holiday, yeah, essentially. Yeah. That, what, that, how does that work when you're on the cabin crew? So do you have to stay there for like, can you stay there for two days on with the destination? Or? So how do I it? say to everyone, <laughs> if you want to be cabin crew, make sure you go to one of the bigger carriers. I, I right. mean, not knocking anyone, right. but if you want to make the most out of it, Go to a long haul carrier, you know, okay. because you have you, you can only work a certain amount of time before right. you need to have a rest period. So okay. for us, you might get on a flight, say 10 o'clock, yeah. you fly out to, I don't know, um, for example, go down to Cape Town yeah. and then you'll get two days, three days in Cape okay. Town, all the expenses paid really? for the airline, yeah, put you up in a beautiful hotel, oh, um, okay. just go and live your life, have a holiday, <laughs> go ahead. and then come back, you might get a few days off at home, and then you're off again, okay. so it, it gave me a chance to um, see things on the other side of the door, because mm. I never... I never ever saw myself as being like cabin crew, you mm, know, like mm, I always saw yeah. myself flying the plane yeah. and you know, you look up to these pilots and think, oh my, one day I'm yeah, going to get yeah. there. But working as cabin crew, it opened up my eyes. Mm. You start to see how, you know, people can sometimes 
um, they can, they can, can look down on you yeah. and sort okay. of judge you, not knowing where you're coming from. Yeah. And I think he just reinforced. I, I'm not a very arrogant person anyway. <laughs> I, I'll treat everybody <laughs> equal, but it just reinforced the idea in my head that. Do you know what? The cabin crew actually do have quite a hard job and yeah. it's a lot of stuff that they're doing. And, you know, mm. if we as pilots can do a bit more yeah. to sort of help them and be mindful to them, you know, it'd be great. Okay. But, but yeah, I was there and then I managed to get a few mentors. So, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but well, I'm not a BA anymore. So I can say, <laughs> no, I think I spent a lot more time in the cockpit than I did in the cabin. Like, you know, so um, we had... But it was really good. Like a lot of the pilots I met there, they were very supportive. They were very encouraging. And um, one thing that one of the captains said to me that stuck with me is, um, when you look at aviation and you look at becoming a pilot, you need to look at it as an investment. Okay. You know, people, they, they want things quickly. Yeah. They want all the benefits, yeah. but you don't look at what goes on behind the scenes. So yeah. if you want to make money out of property, yeah. you need to invest money yeah. in buying the property yeah. in the first place. So. Mm. It's a huge amount of money. Don't get me wrong mm. to, to invest into training to become a pilot, <laughs> but it's an investment. Mm. You know, if that's what you want to do long term, mm. then you have to sort of find a way to make that sacrifice in mm. the beginning to set you up. Um, and I think that's something that I would probably share with anyone that's watching um, <laughs> is um, try not to look and focus too much on the on the figure itself right. but look at it as an investment like it, it, it is i might be biased but i think it's the best <laughs> job in the world <laughs> I, I don't think you, you there is no other job with, that pays you yeah. to go on holiday yeah. like literally that, that that's you're getting paid a good amount of money to go on holiday you know you most jobs what do you have to do you have to work quite hard yeah. you save up your money you try and book some annual leave <laughs> to get that little space and then you, you pay out all that money to go on holiday for a few weeks and then you wait a few months so you do it again but imagine every other day you're wow. in a different city a different country beautiful weather let's face it England's not, <laughs> recently it's been alright but it's, it's not the it hasn't got the most stable uh, yeah. climate so I mean I like I prefer warmer countries you know yeah. Yeah, I, I, I love warmer countries but yeah, I so say look at it as an investment mm. and it will definitely pay off and um, over time. How long did that process, so from example, from, you know, um, from university okay. to the BA to then finally going into so being a pilot? And I started, and see, now I'm going to make myself sound kind of old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I, I started university... 2011 right so okay. 2011 yeah. and i gained my licenses last year august wow so that's what like nine years wow. in total so i i did so i did my degree Jeez. um i graduated obviously the stuff with the RAF happened and yeah. then cut so i wasn't able to go through that route i was at ba for just under three years it was two years and 11 months yeah. um and then I just took it upon myself to start the training. Um, so okay. I, got, I got very frustrated because I think what we all tend to do, we, we wait for a perfect time. Yeah. So we wait that for everything to be set up. So yeah. I thought, you know, I'm just gonna stay a little bit longer so I can save a little bit more, yeah. or I'm gonna wait for this to fall into place or this scholarship to come up. Mm. But I just saw my life ticking by, <laughs> yeah. you know? I was traveling, you know, I had mentors, it was great, but there's one thing to be mentored by a pilot and to and actually do. be a pilot. Yeah. When you're so close to your dream, but you feel so far at the same time. Mm. So, um, from say university mm -hmm. to now, how long did it take you to actually, you know, <laughs> fly a commercial plane? Yeah. Um, so I started university in 2011 Jeez. and I gained my physical license in August, 2020. So that's about that's nine years time, the whole time. Man. So I, I wasn't training throughout the whole period, yeah. but I mean, university was mainly, it's more theoretical side of things. It was, it was a degree in itself. So it was, mm. it was a lot of um, theoretical stuff. But then I got to fly with the RAF while yeah. I was there and train with them, which was good fun. Yeah. But then all of the issues happened with the defense cuts. There were no jobs in the RAF. Yeah. So... I went through that process of trying to apply for flight training programs. 
I don't know why I did it yeah. because I didn't have the money for it, <laughs> but I did it anyway. I was like, you know, go through the process. See, let me just see if I'll get in. And I got onto a few of the programs, oh, really? but then there were 109 grand and 120 grand, which I Whoa. I don't come from money, you know, <laughs> like I, no. If you do, I respect that. But I come from a very humble background, like a little, poor little boy from Hackney. I didn't have that kind of money. So um, I turned down a lot of those opportunities. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, if I work, I can save up some amounts that... And I just thought maybe something will happen. Some kind of scholarship or sponsorship would happen. Mm. At the time... British Airways was actually doing um, a sponsorship program okay. and that's part of the reason and I never told them this in the interview but that, that was part of the reason that I applied for a job at BA because I called them up one day and I was like you know when is your sponsorship going to open back up she's like you know we don't have an exact date but it would look really good if you show an effort by go so I was like what jobs are available at BA and I applied but it, okay. I'm grateful that I did it that's how I ended up at BA and I ended up as cabin crew but by the end of it, with the amount of mentors that I gained there and the experience that I had, it put me in a good standing. But mm. after about two, just about two years there, I was very uneasy on myself. Like, you know, when you know that you're supposed to be doing just something in life anything. and you're not quite there, mm. you start to get uneasy after a while. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I remember I spoke to my family about it and I moved back home that okay. was the first thing I did I was like let me save some money so I moved back home I started to save money that way in terms of like rent and stuff because yeah. you know, London yeah. prices is, is not is not they're not ideal um and then I started to apply for all these schools so right. if you're gonna do a commercial pilot's license right. or a frozen airline transport pilot's license you have to go to approved schools mm. so I was looking at these schools and I was applying to all these schools and I was visiting these schools mm. and I remember I was getting into some of these schools and again I had no money honestly oh, I t- I had a, a, f- a bit of savings but nowhere near enough so how for much the school was it was it a year uh, the, eight, the whole 18 months so, about? so I hadn't even started the school <laughs> I was just applying you know I, I was just applying because it, it's a bit flying is a bit weird because you have to do entrance exams to even get onto a course so to get onto a good course right. uh, so th- there are a few dodgy schools out there that right. if, if anyone's too eager for you to come in <laughs> question that school you know but to get into a good reputable school mm. um, you have to sit entrance exams so I was going through the process of applying to schools wow. then I'll sit in entrance exams which you have to pay for as well they're you not have to pay for the exam it's the most expensive profession <laughs> honestly like my family look at me why would you pick something like why would you want to be a pilot it's it, it's a lot of money they, they charge you for everything it is wow. but um depending on the school like it ranges from about maybe 50 pounds to up to about 350 pounds for uh, an aptitude test wow. to know if you're eligible for that course. Well, and what does that test like in hell, in, in tell? What, what, um, <laughs> I know someone was saying so about colours that, or something that, like that. When people talk about colours and how you see colour, that's to do with your medical. So, um, okay. one of the things um, I would always advise anyone before you part with any money with flight training is go and do a class one medical. Because yeah. if you fail your class one medical, your license is invalid really so it's better to know that you can pass it first <laughs> it'll cost you about 600 in that well when i did it so i did mine in 2017 so and it was about 670 pounds somewhere around there like sort yeah. of like mid to high 600s um and they test everything so they test your eyesight not just uh, your vision but they test your peripheral vision they test oh, really? your reflexes uh, they blow air in your eye I don't know what that test is they test how you see colour as well and this is the bit that catches most people out because people think that if you're colour blind you can't see any colour at all right. but there are levels of colour blindness okay. and um, so th- there's the dreaded dots you know they show you these different numbers within a circle but the whole thing is made up of different colored dots oh, so they open okay. them like what, what number do you see here and you're like 53 <laughs> like uh, hoping for the best but um yeah so they'll do your eyesight they do your hearing they do like ecgs and blood tests oh, and wow. strip you down and they start knocking parts <laughs> of your body and it, it, it's a really thorough test that they do 
Um, but it's to ensure that pilots are fit yeah, to fly because yeah, obviously if, if you're going to take all these passengers you want to yeah. ensure that you know you're not going to pass out <laughs> yeah. at, at the controls or anything but once you do that that's the first thing that i would say make sure you can pass that mm. um, there are some things that you can go away and improve on mm. there are certain things that if it, they show up on that um medical unfortunately you won't be able to fly really? commercially okay yeah so um class one is is the strictest of the civilian licenses uh, right. class one medical is the strictest for your civilian licenses so right. if you can pass the class one right. you basically have to fly everything after right. that you, you you're, you're good you're good um, and then every 12 months you have to renew it um, but it won't be as much you have to renew every, every 12, 12 months. years every, every 12, 12 months. months yeah so every 12 months you have to renew it um, so there's certain things on there that are spread wider, like the ECG, I think it's every five years. It, it break, there's a lot of tests that they do on there, so it breaks wow. down the validity of all of them. But you have to renew your class one every 12 months. Wow. Yeah. And so going back to the exam, yes. what does that test? So the aptitude test, supposedly, it tests the key competencies of a pilot. Like right. those natural skills that you... I think that's that's a, it's a bit questionable, but um, they always said if you're good if you're good at um, like video games, yeah, then you should be relatively good at the aptitude test. Okay. So there there's some tests that test your maths, yeah, um, test verbal reasoning, yeah. um, test your memory, yeah. and there's others that test sort of like hand eye coordination, your reflexes, you do like slaloms and things. Um, they test. Uh, your multitasking skills so you have things where multiple things come up and you have to solve problems while fly this plane and oh, do really? there's it's it's quite it's a good few hours that you, they put you in a room oh, and really? give you different tests um, and then you do like a face to face interview and then you do a a character assessment <laughs> the personality test so <laughs> yeah, you ask you like a hundred <laughs> questions and yeah. you're like hoping that you get the right <laughs> answer but um yeah if you if you if you pass that mm. um, then they'll let you onto the course um, I was quite lucky that. The school that I applied for, mm. they offered me a place, okay. and then I, I actually turned, I, I turned the place down <laughs> originally because I said, you know, I don't think I'll be able to afford it All at right. the time. Um, but they they said they wanted me to come to the school. They were so impressed by the whole assessment and and, and process and my application that they offered me ten thousand pounds oh, towards wow, the cost that's... of my flight and I was like in any other world <laughs> right in any other time in your life if someone gives you ten thousand pounds you think wow that, this is amazing but then when you've got like 89k <laughs> and they give you 10 it's like oh I'm grateful but like, where am I getting the other 79 from but you know when I when I, when I got that I said Do you know what let me push to get this done mm. and you know I remember I I was pulling out my head trying to find ways yeah. of funding this thing and I managed to find like this perfect bank loan like there was this bank oh, that really? was specializing in pilot training loans and they were gonna give the whole amount and mm. you know I managed to find a guarantor so oh, I convinced wow. my granddad <laughs> I was like you know please you know like you know um, so and I remember I went through the whole process the bank agreed mm. I was like yeah I'm gonna start this thing and I went on an integrated route which is the full-time route so once I started I would have to basically like go to university Monday to Friday right. 9 to 5 like doing the training and you know I, I, I paid out my deposit right. to hold my place on yeah. my course you know they stay go and they they size you up do the measurements for your <laughs> uniform I felt good I was like you know I'm, I'm coming I'm gonna do this thing I'd saved up this money because I knew it was full time and I couldn't work and did yeah. it I saved up money I thought I'll live off of this money whilst mm. I'm on the course and then the closer I got to the start date I'm waiting for this money to drop. I'm thinking, you know, the, the, the bank should really have given this money by now, you know. And, you know, I, I won't say what bank it was, but like, I, I started to chase them, you know, like, you know, politely. But, you know, where, where, what's going on with the, with the money? You know, they're delaying, delaying. The school starts chasing you for the first okay. instalment. Because at the time they were paying over four instalments. It was like 19K Jeez. at a time. So... I remember they were going to give away my spot mm. on the course. So I remember I, I got all the savings together that I had to live off of, right? right. 
and I said, you know, if I pay the first instalment from my Maybe savings, the when the bank yeah, pays it, I'll just take it back, yeah, you know? Yeah. And even my savings fell slightly short <laughs> of that first instalment. So I, I did this massive fundraiser at my church oh, and, no. you know, my church gave me some money <laughs> and, you know, people like, oh, you're only going to raise like a few hundred for the fundraiser. I pulled in all the favours from like singers I knew <laughs> and bands. We raised about four and a half K okay, on one weekend. Yes, I set up a GoFundMe page. And so I paid that first instalment, right? About 19 and a half grand. Jeez. I start the course. Still no money from the oh. bank, right? So I'm Jeez. like, okay, cool. I moved to Oxford. I'm like doing this thing already. I walk in there. People are looking at me yeah. as if to say, I don't think you belong here, you know? Like, are you sure you're in the right building? I'm like, but it's all good. You know, this is my dream. I'm going to block it out, you know? It's, it's, it, it's, it is a quite an elitist profession a yeah, lot of the time. You find yeah, a lot of people that go into avia they come from, you know, they come from money mm. or their dads are pilots and or they're, or they're Royal Air Force kids mm. and stuff. So, you know, there, there was a certain type of person <laughs> on the course. I didn't really fit that type of person on the course, but um, I stayed there anyway. And I think for me, what was uncomfortable is I kept my financial situation private I didn't tell them what was happening but the when everybody else was focusing on just their exams and the theories of I was fretting over what was happening the bank is now saying you know my granddad's too old I had to come back to London and find other guarantors it was all this headache and I remember out of nowhere like with no warning like I'm chasing them they just pulled out they, the, the bank, no explanation. They just oh, pulled out gosh. completely. Provided them with all the new information, the new guarantor, they pulled out. There was no chance to appeal. Like, I went all the way to Canary Wharf myself and spoke nothing. They just pulled out, did not, re- they just stopped responding to everything. And now I was stuck with in this situation <laughs> where it's like, <laughs> I have no money to live off of, right? And like, I'm not allowed to work because it's a full time course. I've paid all of my savings in the yeah. first installment if i leave now i've lost that Too money bad. and it's it it wasn't a nice situation <laughs> to be in imagine. i'm telling you and and the way the course is structured you do theory in the beginning so you have about nine months of theory 14 subjects um minimum pass rate of 75 percent wow um and you have to it, it, yeah it was intense and the first thing they said to us on the first day is you know, this is the equivalent of a three-year degree in the space of about nine months. So wow. just be prepared for the quantity of information. You know, you think they're trying to escape. Yeah. No, yeah. 100%. <laughs> like, it was the most... It was information overload. It, it, it was really intense. But the amount of stress trying not to be kicked off the course yeah. was a hundred times worse than mm. the actual training itself. And, like... I can tell you so many stories about how it was and the days I went without food you know my family would send me money thinking that they were providing money for me to live like to eat and stuff but I was literally taking that money paying it off to the school and things like that and yeah so it it wasn't a straightforward process Mm. and then when I got to the and that's when I got to know a lot of the admin staff very well. Because right. I spent a long time in the finance <laughs> offices, you know, negotiating and bargaining and stuff. Um, but I say it, it, it pays it pays to give to others. Mm. And, you know, growing up, I did a lot of work with, like, charity and church and mm. things. And I never wanted anything in return. I just, mm. I just liked doing the stuff. And um, going through that experience, I was able to call on a lot of those people and reach out to right. people and the generosity of people yeah. even the some of the same people that laughed at me and said yeah. that i couldn't do yeah. it i think they realized this guy's <laughs> off his head like he, he's really just gonna do it regardless of what happens so um they did my my church my family friends organization i worked for in the past they did start to put really? money in which allowed me to pay off like a bit but the worst thing is that you can never enjoy it like yeah. you, you never get to a point where it's like oh this is so nice because you pay off one set of stuff and then they're chasing you for more money anyway so um yeah so i, I remember once finished finishing the theory um all the rest of my class went off to spain like because the the foundation flight training was at the spanish campus okay. apart from me 
Uh, because now they got fed off of me delaying my <laughs> payments, isn't it? So I got I actually got suspended from my course. Serious? Yeah, I got suspended from the course because I was behind on my fees and I had to come back to London. And you know because everyone knows that you've gone. <laughs> I got back to London. I didn't tell anyone. I, I don't think I left the house. I went on social media. I just I just secretly <laughs> snuck back into London. And I was set, and I remember this one, I'll never forget, it was this girl out of nowhere that like she, she called me just to check up on how the flying was going. And everyone else that I've spoken to before that, you know, I just faked it, you know, mm. like it's good, like da 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 with her. I don't know, I just, I, I just broke down, I just told her everything. I was just mm. like, this was happening. And she had a company and she was like, you know what, just come work for me for this like that. Come yeah. work, do some work with me, da da da. You just bill me for what you want. Okay. And I worked. I I've never worked so hard in my life. I did I did more hours than I think. I, I waived my, my labor rights. You know they can limit on how much you can work. And I signed the document. I'm fine. I work. And the thing is, I I managed to pay off like a a whole like almost a whole installment yeah. from about six months of work. So I took six months out. Okay. I worked. I paid it all off came back to Spain by that time half my guys were going home I'm like okay. but it's all but you know it was all part of the experience and going out to Spain you know beautiful 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 weather mm. you'd think that I'd, I'd know Spanish living up there I didn't know didn't, didn't quite pick it up but I was out there and oh crazy it was it was it was crazy I, I say my training was probably the best and worst experience of my yeah. life I had so much fun and it was incredible, like mm. flying every day in a random country when they're sending you to fly by yourself, you know, the, the way the course works, like, just, so you, you do nine months of theory, yeah. then you do like foundation flight training in like a little single engine plane. So it's just teaching right. you how do you fly and the basics and then they build upon that knowledge. Then they send you out to fly by yourself for ages. You start building up solo hours and you think, how do they trust us? You, <laughs> yeah. you go and fly by yourself. And then you come back to Oxford right. and you do advanced flight training. So you're in a bigger plane, okay. two engines, you do all your drills, shut down drills. And, you know, there's a part called upset prevention and recovery training where all they do is basically stall your plane and make you nosedive to the ground oh, and spin up and how do you recover, which is probably the highlight of the course yeah. I don't know I'm a bit crazy like I like that stuff um, and then you do the final part where you transition to jets so it's like how do you oh, jet. change from flying prop propeller aircraft and single pilot operations into a multi-career environment wow. so for me it was weird because I didn't get to go smoothly through the yeah. whole process I did my theory was out for six months came back to Spain even out in Spain there's different times and they're chasing me for money. One time I had two <laughs> lessons booked in. It was on my schedule. Came in. They're like, oh no, you can't fly. I was like, what do you mean you can't fly? The head office is saying you haven't paid. I was like, so now everyone knows my business because you you got all of the aircraft. Of it. Then you see Ashes cancelled. Why is Ashes cancelled? Uh, so it was, it was, it was a weird experience because... Mm. Already you're a bit of an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. They already look down on you like, you shouldn't really be yeah. here, but you're trying to think. Yeah. And now you can't even afford your fees. It's like, so it, I think it took a lot of... It, it took a lot of mental resilience mm. to just stay focused and mm. to keep that self-worth. Because mm. at times, I'll be honest, like I would sit there and I just felt ashamed. Like you just imagine. feel... Because obviously you're all in a foreign country. Outside of studying, you get everyone wants to go and have fun. People want to travel. People want to go out to eat. And you're with, you know, you got rich Arabs, you got rich yeah. um, European yeah. people, and they all want to be at the best restaurants <laughs> and stuff. And you're thinking, you know, they're inviting you. Oh, I should come, come. And you're thinking, my the way my account is set up, I can't really afford. And you have some really nice people that they you know they offer to, to pay for you. Think, yeah. Do I want to be the charity case? Not really. So it was a weird experience, but ultimately, mm. I think. Well, I can't speak for everyone, but for a lot of the friends that I made on the course, I know that they gained a much greater respect for me, mm. knowing what I had to and juggle at the time, yeah, because. Yeah. 
I was still always the joker. I was still the one always. So I think I was the most <laughs> happy, go lucky one out of everyone there. And I was having the hardest time, you know. The only thing, my hair did start to feel. Like, my hair was thick and full when I started. I promise, it's hard to believe now, right? But I had thick, thick hair. And like, I remember my hair would just fall out in the sink with the stress. But um, going through the process, mm. you know, I saw, I learned so much about myself. Mm. I learned about... Um, resilience I learned about mm. persistence there's so many people along the way that told me you know maybe you should drop out go away come back in a few yeah, years yeah. and stuff but I was so focused I think yeah. this is where the stubbornness comes yeah. in now, I'm a bit stubborn <laughs> no, but it's not always a bad thing like, I was so stubborn that I, I refused I refused to drop out I was like, no matter what happens mm. I'm going to finish this course mm. and that was my mindset along the way and I think the more I went through is the more I said I need to give something back. Yeah. Um, and like my, my parents think I'm crazy for it, but I would actually fly back to England sometimes to go and do workshops. So a few, okay. a few times yeah. I'd go and do workshops at colleges and I was invited to do like a whole Somewhere. camp that was going on because the more I went through my experiences, the more I wanted people to see, see that yeah. it's possible. As hard mm. as it is, it's actually possible. Mm. And... So when I got to the end of the process, so I mean, well, even before I finished, when I paid that last instalment off, right, I looked at it and I thought, this is not real. You know, when you, you've been fighting for something so long, it's like, this, this can't actually be happening right now. Mm. I, somehow, despite me starving myself, <laughs> I've actually paid off tens of thousands of pounds that I did not have. I never had. Somehow I'm still eaten and I'm still alive <laughs> like I'm not on the street somewhere and um, I remember towards the end of the course um, I had four days left I was out in Ireland the very final stage like on um, Boeing 737 800 like um, simulator doing the, the multi-crew cooperation course and four days to go mm. they lock it down as in it, the whole lockdown happened with the pandemic oh they ship us back to England and I had to sit there for about three months, four months and wait for Are things to open serious? back up. So then I went back, finished those four days God. and you think the whole time I've been going through this process, mm. like the whole journey, you just keep telling yourself at the end of the t like the light at the end of the tunnel like once i get it if i can just get the license that's, <laughs> that's it, it yeah. like i'm set <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's it like everything will be worth it will fall into place and i remember i had offers i had opportunities like with some airlines and some companies that i had like negotiated things with mm. i'm a very I'm a very talkative person. I like to network as well. So, I mean, I, I, I made sure that I set myself up yeah. prior to finishing the yeah, course so yeah, that yeah. I would have a job to go into. Yeah. And I finished the course. Pandemic. Wow. It was, yeah, honestly, it was it, probably the, yeah, the, the hard, the, the worst possible time to finish. And man, the license came celebrated mm. came had an iasa atpl so iasa is like the governing body for europe okay and like a lot of other countries in like the middle east and parts of africa okay. accept this license okay and brexit happens oh. <laughs> 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 and then they like downgrade your license oh to, really to uk only and you think <gasps> this is what i'm saying this one what what do you mean uk so, only? So with aviation, right? <laughs> you so you have different governing bodies for different regions of the world. Right. So if you want to work in America yeah. for like an American company, mm. you have to get what's called a, a FAA, Federal Aviation Authority license. They have right. to issue it to you because that's the body for America. Right. So okay. EASA was the one for Europe. Oh, so the you in okay. Europe, but so because it was essentially the the most respected, you know, well, I mean, some people might debate, but generally it's accepted that it's the most respected license mm -hmm. in the world. Like mm -hmm. it holds a lot of power. Like you can go to a lot of places and use it. So when the UK left the EU, they chose to leave the EASA oh. system. So for people, as much as like, we went for the exact same training program, we did all of the same exams, like literally 
December 31st, mm. I had an EASA license. <laughs> January the 1st, it's like UK only. I said, it hurt. And it, it hurt. The whole, the whole process hurt. It was like a double web. First, you want to take away my job offers. Yeah. Because of the pandemic, because now everyone's making people redundant, and the people who promise yeah. you things are now saying, "Well, actually, we don't have anything, yeah. you know, come back in a mm. bit of time." And then you think, "Well, at least my pool is the whole of Europe," <laughs> and you know, min- then you go UK only. And then it, what hurt more is that you start to look at where the jobs are coming. That when things slowly started to improve, and it was all the European places that wanted okay. it so it, 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 it was it was horrible like i went oh for a bit of a, a very low period because yeah. you think this is my life stream but you know it gave me time to really reflect upon my journey mm. and reflect upon what i can do mm. to give something back mm. um, and in that process um i i created mm. um this organization whereby we can make flying more accessible yeah. for young people from yeah. inner city and working class backgrounds yes, and, yes. and try and encourage more people that look like us yeah. to... And, the, and and people sometimes make out like it's a bad thing to say that, you know, I don't discriminate against no, anybody. Of course not. But the reality is going through the process, there was nobody who could give me advice. Like when I was at school, mm. my career's advisors didn't know how to become a pilot yeah. you know work experience i remember my my the work experience lady literally i think she got fed up with me pestering her she was like here's my office here's the phone do what you want i had to call around airports myself and be like you know i want work experience and, I, and you know luton airport gave me work experience mm. it, but there, there was no help for me but yeah i think out of um out of a bad experience yeah. like it gave me an opportunity to sort of think about what I could do to give back mm. um, and what I can do to sort of change the face of aviation yeah. in this country and yeah. I think sometimes people get upset yeah. when you when you say you want it to be more accessible <laughs> but um, you will never have a shortage mm. of the, the native British people mm. going into this field you're never mm. gonna have a shortage of quite wealthy people going into this field mm. but why can we not do a bit more to mm. make young people that have the aptitude yeah. understand how to get into yeah. um, this field? So um, we started off just by just running workshops and, and programs and assemblies in schools and colleges and universities yeah. wow. um, just to get people thinking about it. Mm. Um, just before I left, um, maybe I shouldn't tell, oh dear, maybe I shouldn't tell you the airline, but I mean, just before I left a very major airline in this, com- in this country, um, I, I, I sat down with the head of pilot recruitment, you know, um, I took a meeting with her and she literally said to me, she was, she, she was very honest with me, she said that, you know, out of four and a half thousand pilots here, it was a ridiculous number it was like less less than a hundred out of the four and a half thousand were black wow so it was like you you really want an airline that's going to reflect yeah the 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 makeup of the country the diversity of the country but um and she is the one that admitted to me that it's not even it goes beyond discrimination because you don't even have the black uh, pilots or pilots from uh, ethnic and working class backgrounds mm. to discriminate against. Yeah. <laughs> because what happens, which is true, like, like I was very stubborn. So when people told me I couldn't do it, I was like, well, watch <laughs> me. Let me show you that I can do it. But for most people, if you're a young, if you're in school, if you're in college and you're saying that this is what I want to do, that like, I want to fly planes, I want to be a pilot. Mm. And your teachers, your careers advisors, mm. your mentors, they're all saying, yeah, no, that's not really achievable, mm. you know? Like, you know, oh, do you know how much it costs? And pe- mm. people think they're being nice. They yeah. think that... They, so, some people, okay, they have their views. That yeah. look great. But there's other people that they think they're actually being helpful. Mm. I had people in my own family that they thought that they were doing me a favour by trying to convince me to do something else. You know, do... Yeah. do <laughs> I remember one person was like... Why don't you be an air traffic controller? <laughs> you can still look at the planes all day. It's like, what? Like, that's, that's, it's not the same thing. But, <laughs> like, honestly, pe- 
people when you have discouragements constantly and you have nobody that can point you in the right direction mm. how do you expect people to navigate through the confusing channels of aviation mm. it's like if you live in certain villages on the outskirts of oxford or something mm. well you, your friend at school is likely that their dad <laughs> is a pilot so it's yeah. easy you'll find some but how often do you bump i i lived in london yeah. most of my life do you know yeah. i didn't bump into any pilots <laughs> anywhere do you know, yeah, I I know who, who, who was there for me to go and speak yeah. to and get advice from so um how we started was to try and be that person be that group mm. whereby young people who are interested in pursuing the career mm. have access to information That's they nice. have access to advice they have access to mentors and yeah. they can just see somebody like themselves it's like you know sometimes people see you and they assume that you know you had it good yeah you, know, you yeah. had it nice <laughs> but when you sit down and you start to explain to them no, no actually <laughs> this is where i've come from mm. this is what i've had to overcome you know i Grew up in Hackney, went to school in Tottenham. Mm. You know, I was went to college in like Leighton. Is it, some of the crazy stuff that happened along the way. I didn't come from yeah. the, the the smoothest of backgrounds, but I had a dream, and despite all of the challenges and the discouragements that came, I was determined to achieve that yeah. dream. And so, if you have that determination, if you have that persistence, and mm. you have that ability to seek out information for yourself mm. not just take it off the back of other people um then i honestly believe that anything is possible yeah, for you um agree. so that's where it started from and then we were like how do we convince more people yeah. to become pilots because <laughs> we need more females yeah. there's like they're underrepresented we need more that, like so then that's when we started to really just flood the schools flood the colleges mm. and just showcase what this job is all about yeah. and show what it involves and um just 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 get young people thinking about yeah. it um which has begun really well so the next steps and what we're hoping to do um towards the end of the year mm. is to then offer actual flying experiences That's cool. for many um of these uh, oh, that, young people, that, but to be honest, everybody. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I shouldn't <laughs> just say young people. Like anybody who who, who wants to have that experience for themselves, it's how do we make aviation in general more accessible? Yeah. Like if I said to you now, you know, you can literally hire a plane and we can go up to Scotland tomorrow. Oh. You think to yourself that must be like <laughs> tens of thousands of pounds yeah, yeah. list, but. It's possible. Like mm. we can do these things, and we can mm. open up these experiences mm. for more people. But nice. you, you just have to be intentional mm. and want to give something back. So um, there's a lot. There's there's a lot of things in in the pipelines, um, and then we want to try and make that accessible, and then support young people into like private pilots license. There's a whole. There's a whole. Um, what's the word? Like action plan mm. and goals at set at certain times, but um. It's something that I don't think I would have been able to do had it not been um, for the pandemic. And then on the flip side, mm. what's really good is that it's a, it's t sometimes I think, what a horrible profession. Because <laughs> one of the things that works against you is that once you finish and you qualify, a lot of airlines, they want you to have a certain number of hours experience before uh, they take you but it's like how okay. do you get that experience yeah. there are some airlines that will take you straight away like the, some airlines take you straight away but there are others that you require more experience and for a lot of guys that have gone through the program you spent all this money you've passed mm. if it takes you maybe six months to a year to get your first job a lot of the skills you will you'll start uh, they'll fade you yeah. get what's called skill fade over time so yeah. what we wanted to do was not only provide support for those young people that want to go into aviation but how do you provide support for the newly qualified yeah. guys so yeah. if we can provide a space yeah. where these newly qualified guys are allowed are able to fly mm. that we're giving them flight experience mm. and in exchange all you're doing is that you're taking our young people yeah. up that are going yeah. through our programs then everybody's win. benefiting yeah. and we're win, supporting win. the community together yeah. you know yeah. so um that's what we're doing. It's called Urban Wings, Urban um, by the way. Okay, um, Urban Wings. Um, do you know, I would give you the website, but you know, <laughs> we, we're actually updating everything. But um, it, in Urban fact, if, what you can do, like if anyone is interested, um, mm. if you 
follow me on Instagram. It's yeah. just at Asher Mack, A-S-H-E-R-M-C-K. Um, all the updates will be on there. Nice. Um, so you'll see when the website's back up and running and if you wanted to book us to come to like your school or college or anything like yeah, that, you can do it. Um, nice. And if you're interested in joining one of the upcoming programs, then you can do that as well. Um, so yeah, so wow. that's more or less um, ha- the way I've been going. Um, a lot of things are 12 months. Like 12 months <laughs> is, a, is, a, is, a, is a favorite in aviation. So right. your medical every 12 months you have to renew, but your license never expires. But oh, okay. there are things on your license that expire. Oh, so really? it's, 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 if you're at an airline, it's great because they pay for everything. Okay. If you're not at an airline, you better be prepared oh. to find the money to go and redo it and renew things. But um, I would just say for anyone who's interested, um, the key things that you need, the key things that you need in order to fly for an airline or for cargo, it's the same thing. You need what's called a frozen ATPL. And what that's made up of is a commercial pilot's license, mm. um, a multi-engine instrument rating, okay. um, your ATPL theory, so that's the 14 exams um, that I said in the beginning with wow. the 75% oh, yeah. pass mark. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's a few other bits like um, your MCC stuff and UPRT. But wow. um, the reason I split it up like that is if you wanted to go do a modular route, mm-hmm. which can actually work out cheaper sometimes, it's almost like pay as you go, you can do them individually. Mm-hmm. So you'll start with like a private pilot's license, um, mm-hmm. which is... Uh, mm. about 45 hours minimum you need you sit uh, seven exams you then a theory, theoretical exams you then do a, a test and that if you pass it it allows you to Ooh. fly single engine piston aircraft so that's where you'll start from and then you build you do like your hour building you'll do um, your multi-engine piston rating you do your commercial pilot's license and you just add to it you add to it. you do your mm. advanced upset prevention recovery training and it means that you can work and train at the same time. So like you can spread yeah. the costs like over that. a greater period. Mm. Like in, in the olden days, I don't know say olden days, <laughs> but back in the days, um, airlines didn't like it. They, they used, you had to do the integrated route, but now mm. it's not like that. Some people, it's a myth. Like if people tell you that you cannot work for an airline going a modular route, that's a lie. Okay. It's not like that anymore. As long as you are at um, credible schools right. and you have a very coherent mm. um, logbook like you can follow very clearly okay. so so we we have logbooks yeah. like, in fact, i have my logbook <laughs> with me okay. but um your logbooks it it tracks all of your flights mm. so all of your flights all of your hours so at the end of your career you might have fifteen thousand hours and you can actually look back through all of them know what aircraft you flew which airport it was from to etc wow. but if you can if you have consistency in your flight schools and it's logged clearly, um, then your modular route um, will be equally respectable. Um, integrated is good for some people. I prefer the integrated route because it's full time. Mm. It's you just. It's harder to become distracted because yeah. for the those that till eighteen to eighteen months to two years. Yeah. All you're doing, you eat, drink, yeah. sleep, flying, yeah. and yeah. and you go through the process quite quickly. It's all done with one school. It's all done with familiar faces and instructors, um, and you get every single element of that training. All the different licenses, the ratings, the exams, everything mm. is included in that package. Um, so that is another option. It's a little bit more expensive, but it can sometimes be worth it. Um, mm. The advice that I would give for people that want to go down that route um, and based on a lot of the questions that I get from people normally is don't be sucked in by glossy brochures some of these schools spend so much money on marketing that they don't have as much left for their actual (laughs) (laughs) facilities so um, you might see amazing posters you might see amazing like websites but um, make sure you visit the schools for yourself. Right. Like go to the schools, um, speak to the students, speak to the instructors, get a feel for the school. You know, mm. you're investing a lot of money into your training. Yeah. You want to make sure you're in an environment that you feel comfortable in, mm. that you 
know you're going to get your money's worth mm. you know ask questions like don't let them feel like um you are as as much as you are a student don't let them push you into thinking you're yeah. a student that can't ask questions mm. because you're a customer before a student mm. you're paying a lot of money to be there so ask the questions mm. test it out for yourself look at their facilities ask them to look at the aircraft <laughs> see if the rubber's hanging off the ceiling or if they've got good quality aircraft you know um talk about where are your graduates now like what wh are they flying mm. like, what, like what sort of things do you do what you know is my accommodation included in the price okay. is my food included? like just ask questions and really mm. make sure that you are comfortable with your school before you go there because it will be some of the most stressful few months of your life it's a lot of pressure um, but it will be incredible. Like you can build friendships for life, mm. experiences and memories for life. Mm. So you want to make sure you have the school and environment that works for you. What's your favorite memory through, throughout? Like what is your favorite oh, memory? Oh, one, just one. Um, <laughs> so I think my favorite memory, um, mm. flying wise, my favorite memory, yeah. we were doing upset prevention and recovery training and they were teaching us how to recover from like a, a, a spin so basically if your aircraft is out of control like right. if you haven't corrected your stall and you know we had three days of theory before this so they were telling us about this and we're drawing diagrams but looking at something on the board <laughs> is very different <laughs> to being in the aircraft and it's like you know he, they, the, the instructor will take it and he started he stalled the plane and then the plane's nose dropped and it started to spin. Oh. So this thing is, is like a corkscrew going towards the ground. It's, just, it's spinning like this, going towards the ground. And, you know, he did it and he let go of the controls and said, you have control, recover. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I'm seeing the ground come up to me really quick. I, I'm just, you know, normally if you're flying, you know, you see there's, there's a horizon, you see the horizon, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's ground, there's sky. There was no sky here. It was just ground. <laughs> it's just ground everywhere. And, it, you know, the, the, the technique, they were saying, you know, you kind of, you unload, you release all the pressure in the stick. So, you, but what it looks like sometimes is you push forward slightly. Yeah. But what that did was make the nose go even steeper. Oh. So I remember he was like, unload, and I push forward. And every single thing in the plane that wasn't strapped <laughs> down, there was dirt, uh, <laughs> sick bags, it all just came flying. I'm hanging on the harness and the dirt is just hitting me in the back of my head. It was like in my eye, I'm like trying to fly one-handed. Um, and I managed to recover the plane, like, you know, really? straight and level. But I think for me, wow. as terrified as I was, the yeah. adrenaline rush I yeah. got, <laughs> and then you did it about four more times after that, but it, it, it was like flying-wise, I think that was the most fun um, that I had in terms of that just wow. overall experience I think because everyone is going through this together you do build really strong connections mm. so when we were out in in Oxford we were close but you know it's still England you know I could come back to London when mm. I was in Spain mm. there was no one else you know mm. and we used to just sometimes you know it's good to have free trips that you don't have to pay for <laughs> just go hiking in the mountains and go and find like waterfalls and rivers mm. and you just had space where you think this is unreal like mm. I'm actually living in a whole other country doing my dream mm. and it, it was just those moments see like you, you because when you're always fighting you're always trying to complete the, you're always trying to pass something you're always trying to pay off fees mm. to have those moments when you're just Relax. free to yeah. take it in and really deep that this is real. Yeah. Like all these years, it's coming together now. Yeah. That was nice. Yeah. I think that that was really nice. And, you know, having people come to you and show a recognition for what you've had to overcome mm. to get this far, you know, and people show how your story has encouraged them yeah. and how it's motivated them to keep going and yeah. they were going to give up. It's, like those sorts of feelings, you can't replicate that yeah, anywhere else. Yeah. It, 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 it almost makes you feel like, you know, it was worth it. Yeah. You know? I'll, I'll sacrifice yeah, it, you yeah, know. Yeah. I'll go through all the stress of everyone if it means it helps. But yeah, it was, yeah, it was incredible. It was okay, incredible. It was okay. incredible. 
All right, so what we're going to do now, we're going to go to another part of the, cool. of the show. It's just called, like, it's rapid fire. So okay. I'm, I was talking a lot. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, sorry. No, no. I lot, no, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so basically, it's um, either yes or no, or pick a choice. So our first question is, okay. have you ever had any major technical issues while flying mid-air? Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> More than once. <laughs> Really? Yes. What, what happened? <laughs> I know, I know. It's What's this rapper? <laughs> <laughs> when I was out in Spain, like, there was this one plane that, you know, you just hope that you were never booked on this plane. There was always problems. And I tried to start the plane up. This is on the ground first. Tried to start it up. It wouldn't start. So I called the engineers out. They came. They're looking in the engine. And I've got the video of it, actually, because this guy is like, banging in the engine and I don't know what he was knocking he's like banging away in the engine he steps he's like try it now it starts up I was like are you sure he's like don't just don't turn it off I was like are you sure that this is like safe but he's like yeah 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 it's fine it's fine it's fine I was like okay I was by myself this was a solo flight so I'm like taxiing away I do my engine checks before this I was like mm. I remember I took off and where we were in Spain like our airport was right at the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains is mm. a place called Huesca. So you take off, the mountains are there, right? And then it's, it's like a drop and... Listen, <laughs> we took off. I've got full power on the engines. This plane should be climbing away right. from the runway. It's like it didn't want to go anywhere. Like I was probably about three or four hundred feet feet off the runway at this point but it i was too i had gone too far for me to land back onto the runway oh. and because it's on a bit of a hill you take off and then it drops so then i went from maybe 300 feet to maybe a <laughs> thousand feet now because we're, we're high and i'm trying to climb like i'm I, i'm trying to make this plane climb like so it's full power i'm trying pulling back this clip this plane would not climb at all and as i was trying to climb i kept getting the stall warning so which means that there's not enough airflow over the wings to keep it in the air so if you stall your plane's gonna oh. drop so i'm trying my best to keep this plane going nothing then i've got full power i'm trying to go up i'm seeing on the altimeter that shows your height that I'm going down. <laughs> I'm like, wait, but wait, what? <laughs> why, why is it going down? Like, at this point, there's nothing I can do to go. Uh, everything I'm doing is what you would do for a plane to climb. This plane is going down, right? So I'm thinking, maybe I can return to the to the airport, right? So I tried to turn because obviously the airport's behind me now. Yeah, so yeah. I need to turn. To get, I'm trying to turn. <laughs> Every time I turn more than maybe 10 degrees, I'm here in the stall one. I'm like, I'm going to die. Like, honestly, I was sitting down. I was like, this is it. Like, this is what my mum warned me against. That's why they said they don't want... You know, I'm trying to think, you know, I'm thinking air crash investigation. What are they going to say on the news? This little black boy from Hackney was like... I was... No, I was actually so scared. And I thought to myself, okay, okay. Uh, let me. I was testing all these different things. I was trying. I was going through different checks and stuff. And like at the time, the airport we were at, they only had air traffic control from like nine in the morning to about one thirty in the oh. afternoon. So now there's no <laughs> controller. It's just me up there, like on the radios. And I'm trying to tell people in the area, don't come near me because I can't really control my plane right now. So I'm slowly doing the shallowest turn I can, trying to go back. The worst thing, do you know, and I've the worst thing is I managed to get round enough to set up for a landing okay. and then things started to work. It felt like it was working again. So I did what's called a touch and go. Like, so I, I landed, like touched the wheels on the runway and just took off again because I thought maybe it's working now. Like, I, I don't know. The moment I took off again, the same thing. I was like, you know what? God clearly he loved me enough to help me to land and what did I do when I play with my life again so I think for me of all the technical problems that was the worst like I've had wow. I've had wow. other issues um, we had where our engine we had heavy engine vibrations mm. um, and we were getting some indications where it looked like the engine was going to cut out 
Um, and when you're flying single engine, that's not great because you only have one engine. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, like we've had. Um, I've been there when we had like wind shear, where it's like the wind has a sudden change of direction and speed. So. <laughs> Uh, we were on landing, the plane being thrown about, we're coming in, and it's like just before we took the plane, just lost all lift completely. The runway's here, we just about made it. Like, we were bit, I've had some crazy experiences, but flying is still the safest form of travel, statistically. Like, uh, but yeah, no, we've, yeah. No, it's, but that one, the one where I, I, I couldn't climb, I think for me, was the worst. I think that was the only time where. I genuinely thought that I might die. Wow. I was like, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. Yeah, you know, I was looking for fields. Do I have to <laughs> land in a field somewhere? Like, I don't know. So, don't yeah. you have like a parachute on that? No. <laughs> so, when I, so when I was training with the Royal Air Force guys, we always flew with yeah, parachutes. Yeah, that but, makes sense. Yeah, you, that, that's a myth. <laughs> everywhere else, uh, everywhere outside of the army, oh, right. they don't give you parachutes. And to, to be honest, I think it's a good thing. Like, because, <laughs> because if you, you knew know, that you, you could save jump, yourself. You are, you're not trying. Like, if you don't have a parachute, you know, I'm doing everything in my power to, to get this thing on the ground safely. You know, like, which is, which is, I'm t- when, we, uh, t- when I was working at um, BA, all these people put that. Like, do we have like parachutes under the? It's like no, we don't. Unfortunately, like we're just gonna have to hope that we get onto the ground safely. You know. For our second question. Okay. Would you rather land on a short runway uh-huh. or in severe weather conditions? <laughs> so, do you know what it? That is a. Is it on a short runway that is capable to take my aircraft or a short runway that I'm going to overrun and drop off the other end? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm saying. It's a hard one to answer. <laughs> I, I know. I'm sorry. All right. Let me not be difficult. Um, hmm, I will say a short runway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll say, do you know what the problem is? In my head, I'm actually working it out in my head. We have like a minimum landing distance. So when you do your performance calculations, okay. you know the minimum length you need in order to land safely. So uh, I don't mind a short runway as long <laughs> as it meets the minimum. <laughs> if it doesn't, I'll take severe weather <laughs> because it might be harder, but at least I know I'm going to make it up to the runway. That's why. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for our third final question, what prepares you more for takeoff? Meditation or weightlifting? Weightlifting? Okay. I don't know. I think. Yeah. Do you know? I'll go for weightlifting. Okay. On this one. I don't know. Do you want to know why? I don't go ahead, know. Go ahead. I'll try. I think. Um, I don't know. Calm. I get your get your blood pumping. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. if you've got like an old school aircraft <laughs> that you know you have to use that raw strength. There's not as much hydraulics to help you. Then you might need to put your foot on the dash and pull back. Maybe. I don't know. Do you know what was crazy? When I was in Spain, we had a gym on campus, right? Mm. And. <laughs> so we, we go to the gym if you ever do like legs on a day that you know you're going to be doing asymmetric flight so when you're doing multi-engine stuff they will cut the engine they'll cut one engine so you fly with one engine oh. and you have to keep your foot down on the rudder okay if that happens to you after leg day <laughs> trust me a few times i'm on the rudder my leg is trembling like that so maybe in those situations, <laughs> meditation would be better. But take off wise, I'll say, yeah, weightlifting right. would probably might be better. Right. Yeah. And our last kind of questions What is the biggest contribution that your profession holds in helping society? I, 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 think, I think it depends on the type of pilot you become. Okay. So, with the license that I hold, you can, you can become. You can actually work in a lot of fields. So um, people look at it and think it's only airlines. But yeah. you can work for an airline. You can work 
for a cargo carrier, you can be a corporate pilot flying business jets. Okay. You can go and work for like a, a, a missionary uh, outpost okay. somewhere. You can work for the United Nations. Mm. It's, I think it very much depends on the type of pilot you become. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously looking at the more humanitarian side of things, if you're working for the UN or one of these guys, then you are literally saving lives. If you're doing mm. like medical evacuations, there are areas of the world where they have quite poor infrastructure. There are not roads, there are not rail. Mm. So planes are their lifeline. It's the mm. only way they can get to safety in the space of time that they need. They can get the medical attention they need or the food or supplies. So in that sense, that's quite a positive contribution. Yeah. I think in a more generic way, in terms of like uh, airlines and, and cargo operators, we do not realize how much cargo comes in by air. So oh, a really? huge amount of are you, the fruits that we get, because a lot of a lot of things they have to come within a short. They have quite a short uh, shelf life. So mm. if they have to come into the country fairly quickly, mm. um, something as simple as flowers. People don't appreciate this when you go and buy a bouquet of flowers for the missus. A lot of it might be coming from maybe Amsterdam or from Nairobi. They have a big flower uh, market. They get flown in, in the belly of a lot oh, of these really? aircraft. So foods that we have, certain meats and fishes and things, things that are perishable and they can't be put on ships for long periods of time, they are all flown in. So uh, it's highly beneficial for society yeah. and even our supply chains, you know, they, they've been speaking a lot about that recently, yeah, um, yeah. just in time supply chains. Yeah. With the pandemic, as much as people were not able to go on holiday, a lot of cargo couldn't be delivered in time. So you have delays in things, in medical equipment, in cars. So mm. aviation plays a very important role in mm. keeping our society functioning and moving as it does today. Um, so I think mm. from that perspective, I think we contribute um, quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah. And I think in terms of our own mental health, it's good to go on holiday. holiday yeah. Like I think it's important. It's important to take a break and leave this place to get some vitamin D to like get fresh air. You know, to in, to, to to see new cultures, try yeah. new things, to be reconnected with family overseas. Mm. Like if we didn't have pilots to take us there, we'll probably be in the ship for like three or four weeks yeah. at a time. So I think, in so many ways, we contribute positively this. to society. And do you see your profession progressing in any way i don't know more technology uh, more state uh, I, I don't know do you see it progressing in any different way i think um <clears throat> when you look at the technology that many manufacturers are working on now so i know airbus they're trying to create um, a passenger aircraft that can be flown by one pilot right um, rather than two so at the moment, okay. all commercial, like passenger aircraft over 19 or so. Like so you, when you go on an EasyJet flight, that's sort of an A320, that sort of size, mm. um, you require two pilots to fly that aircraft, a minimum of two pilots. Right. So they're trying to cut out one of the pilots. So obviously for someone like me, I'm, you know, <laughs> slow down on that technology. <laughs> like let's, let's have jobs for all of us. Um, but I think, I think that's the direction which... Uh, technology is going mm. within the flight deck. I think the more uh, the the thing that we'll see more f uh, sooner rather than later. I don't know, lost train of thought there. Mm. So the thing we'll see sooner rather than later is improvements in the efficiency of aircraft because everybody right now is quite concerned about the environment yeah. and they're quite wary about their carbon footprint. Yeah. The Dreamliners, the A three fifties, they are hugely more fuel efficient than really? the previous generation of aircraft but i think that's something that will be pushed going into the future as, as airlines and manufacturers try to lower their carbon footprint they'll make more fuel efficient engines mm. they'll make aircraft out of more uh, carbon fibers and other mm. new materials that are lighter which yeah. burn less fuel um they, they so you know they're changing 
um, approach paths and patterns so that um, instead of doing stepped approaches like continuous approaches which burn less fuel mm -hmm. so they're, they're trying really harder than the industry how do we lower our overall carbon footprint and become mm -hmm. uh, more friendly yeah. um, to the environment um, as for me personally within my career um, I think the type of person I am I can't I, I can't stay still I, as in I, I don't I, I, I can't be uh, stagnant I think I love my career and I've, I will do this until the day they drag me kicking and screaming <laughs> off the plane but um, one thing I want to do next year I want to get an aerobatics rating if I get it so aerobatics is it's like acrobatics but for a plane so right. so we have to flip the plane and do all of those oh, things is it um, like do tricks in the air you yeah know when so they do that exactly oh. exactly so it, you can do a bit more training and yeah. then they'll add that qualification if you like they call it a rating but it's like a qualification that it adds to your license so that's one of the things that was on my oh, cool. um, my my yeah, bucket list cool. i wrote one of those um the, the 30 before 30 <laughs> and it's on there so like so i, I want to do that um and that way I'll be able to improve what we can offer through Urban Wings because right, I want to yeah. make all of these experiences more yeah, accessible. So, yeah. you know, I think just an experience in a plane itself is great, but how do we top it? Like, where yeah. do we go from there? How do you make, how do we increase the variety of things mm. that we can offer? So I think alongside all of the airline stuff, you know, I would happily progress. You know, I mm. see myself um, on in on long haul like that that's where I belong on long haul you know um, I, I I love it like you know let me fly for like I don't mind flying ten hours and getting four days on the beach yeah, that's yeah, fine yeah. Um, but professionally that's where I see myself and hopefully move up into more of a training captain position because I'd love to sort of mentor and train the new guys that are joining right, um, right. but on the outside of that I want to grow and expand Urban Wings yeah. and try and um, broaden their reach, yeah. um, offer more experiences, and ultimately be able to offer scholarships. That's that's the that's the end goal yeah, with that as well. I'll offer like um, a certain number of scholarships each year for young people from backgrounds that wouldn't be able to do it yeah. usually, um, just so that just in, some people they go for an experience and when they get there, they're so almost proud that they did it by themselves yeah. that they forget everyone else yeah. and they turn their back on yeah. where they're from and. You know, yeah. for me, I want to be the person that I never had. Yeah. That's it. The person that I wish I had yeah. when I was growing up and going through the experience. Yeah. I want to try and become that person for those that are coming up behind me. Yeah. You know, mm. I remember when I was at university mm. and people were like, where are you, where are you from? Yeah. You know, when I was speaking to the, to, to the more, what's the word? <laughs> the... the the more refined folk, <laughs> I'll tell them, you know, I'm from Stoke Newington. And it sounds really nice. But then when I was speaking to like, the man, then, where are you from? I'm from Hackney. But I think, <laughs> I think now, coming through that process and coming out the other side, I think I'm proud of where I come yeah, from, you know. Yeah. I'm proud of my upbringing. I'm proud of the places that, and the things that I had to overcome mm. in order to get where I am. And... Mm. I will never, like I'm purposing in my heart, I will never be that person mm. that runs away yeah. from their history yeah. and from their, their their upbringing and just turns their back on that community. Yeah. Like, I know now it's a bit, a lot of gentrification is <laughs> taking place there, right? You no, know, I'm talking about real Hackney, like before it looked like this. But, um, but it's still there, you know, there's still pockets of, of, of people and communities all around the country, not just Hackney, but all around the place that, you know, they need somebody to be on their side and to put mm. things in place to support them. So I think that's where I see myself in the long term. And that's what I see myself doing. Yes, nice. I know you spoke about loads of different things that could be potentially missing, but do you feel that there's anything else that is missing from your profession as a, as a pilot? I think um, when the jet age first came around, people had a huge amount of respect for pilots and yeah. the salary matched it. Yeah. The, um, just the, the whole package that was offered by companies and airlines hmm. matched the, the respect. And that's where people get the image of a pilot. Yeah. I think what's happened now, um, is 
companies are becoming a little bit more um, conservative okay. with how they want to spend. I would say um, for the amount of investment yeah. that people make in their training, yeah. um, I feel like the rewards could be better. Right. Um, and, and that's not direct at any particular company or anything because there are some companies that are incredible that have mm. huge pay packages very good reward packages but generally speaking if you look across the board mm. I think the perks the benefits the pay the conditions they're starting to come down like they, they, they are coming down really? um, instead of going up um, so um, but for me if, if I I just think people should enter a profession based on their aptitude mm. and their ability to succeed mm. um, rather than their status or the background that they come from mm. um, and that's why i will shout it from the rooftops until i'm blue in the face <laughs> that you know we need to make aviation more accessible yeah. because there's a lot of people mm. a lot of young people even older people that they have the aptitude they have the ability they just don't have the finances mm. um, or they don't have the know-how to, to, to yeah. access a career so i think we can do more um as pilots we can do more as airlines mm. we can do more um, to reach out to people in those communities um, and support them into careers um, in aviation. Mm. And to people that are thinking about it, do not listen to all of these <laughs> random <laughs> statements and rumours that people say as facts because they don't know. Yeah. They just heard it from somebody yeah. and it's just passed down for the generations. Like people turn around and say, you know, why would you want to be a pilot? You can't have a family yeah. as a pilot. Huh. That's not true. Like, do you, know, they, do you know how many people have said that to me? But Asha, what are you going to do? You're going to be alone your whole life. No, but, well, realistically, you know, we, you have very, very strict um, working time legislations. Okay. So you have to have a certain number of days off a month. Okay. You have to have a certain number of ref days at home over the duration of a year you can't fly more than 900 hours in a year okay. it's like when you average some of these guys the amount they a lot of people have more days off yeah. a year than they actually do oh, at work okay. and a worst case scenario it's yeah. like okay if i've got a seven day trip to punta cana yeah i just take my family with me yeah, you know yeah. like is it it's not that hard like so well i say it to say like people will make big bold statements mm. and if you don't fact check it for yourself you will start to internalize these things and say no 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 actually maybe this is not for me mm. but if you're interested if you're serious about a career in aviation go to the source itself don't mm. just take on board what people have heard from somewhere don't be put off and discouraged by the price tags or anything like that mm. literally if that's what you want to do stick at it reach out to people be persistent mm. persevere and I'm talking from experience yeah, it's not because no, I read no, it somewhere no, no, no. I'm <laughs> telling you from experience <laughs> like if you stick at it you 100% you'll get through um, and you will not regret it at all and um, you know you were talking about um, uh, the jet age yes. and the respect yes sometimes I do think I don't know this might be a misconception mm. but that um, pilots they have the autopilot <laughs> <laughs> and then you know they, they just they just cruise and they is that the truth <laughs> like I, I don't know do you know like uh, do you know you, so many people say this they're like you guys don't even do anything you, know, what, you, you fly for five seconds you land and then that's it but when I before I started my course yeah. I heard people say and I disagreed but it didn't affect me as much in, until after yeah. once you go through all that training yeah. and you realise what's going on up there then you understand how much a pilot actually does mm. so like when you're flying those aircraft originally that we we were not allowed to use the autopilot for huge amounts because they wanted us to hand fly everything but oh, there's a lot of things you have to do to keep it in perfect balance and you have other tasks that you need to do when you're flying so if all your concentration is going on to keeping this aircraft straight and level you won't have the capacity to do other things so when the autopilot is on it's not a human like it doesn't have a brain of its own like it's not ai it's not like we haven't got to that stage yet it's literally a computer so it will only do what you tell it to do so 
I will do a huge amount of work before the flight in terms of preparation, flight planning, understanding what's going to happen. I'll input a lot of that information into the computer, right. the, 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 the computer, the flight management computer on board. And then it's kind of managing a system. But although right. I'm managing the system for it to fly, I'm still monitoring so many other things on board the aircraft. So it's a it's a big misconception yeah. that we don't do anything. Um, and even I would love, I wish, I wish I I could take you guys up yeah, and yeah, show yeah. you like for yourself. <laughs> you one one I will keep uh, in yeah, touch. Yeah, okay. All right? <laughs> and I'll definitely yeah, try yeah. and arrange oh, that we can wait. go yeah. flying one time. Yeah, um, and you'll see for yourself mm. just how much more you do even when the autopilot is on okay. right because you you have to manage the system manage the overall safety of the aircraft you're monitoring a lot of things monitoring the fuel monitoring the route the route progression you're monitoring the radios you're monitoring traffic around you like mm -hmm. you, there's so many things traffic that, around you so other like, aircraft so it, other aircraft other helicopters really yeah oh, like, I was, you know, I it's a big air so it's not you're not going to get that much traffic what You'll be surprised. Really? So the southeast of England is some of the busiest airspace in the world. So really? it de depending on again, it depends on the type of flying that you're doing yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, if you're doing VFR flight, like visual flight rules, just sort of flying around yourself. There's areas that are called uncontrolled airspace <laughs> where you literally can just whiz around in there. It's like a free for all, like, and you literally have to be looking and ducking other planes that are around. And that is, I'm not even exaggerating. It's I've had like situations where you see a plane coming and you, you have to like dive to get out of the way. Wow. Um, this is in a smaller aircraft. Let me just <laughs> put a disclaimer out there, like in, in a much smaller aircraft. But once you get into a commercial environment, like an airline environment, yeah. um, a lot of that stuff will be done on airways. So okay. again, it's a lot of planes flying there, but you'll be separated by air traffic control. Yeah. Wow. But, but it's all. But I made the point to say there's a lot going on in your mind mm. and a lot that you're doing, even though you might not physically have your hands on the control right. to turn left and right, which in the grand scheme of things is actually the easiest thing to do when you're flying. Okay. So, yeah. Wow. It's been an incredible experience. And, um, I know. Sorry for talking no, so much. No, I feel no, like no. I had that <laughs> oversharing. <that's okay. laughs> no, it's, been, it's been amazing. I've learned so much. Um, and I'm, again, I'm really pleasure to have you here. Thank you for that. It's been you. amazing. Um, as you know, the show is called The Professionals You Should Know. Is there any other professionals that you think that we should know or any other profession that you think we should know? Oh, wow. Put me on the spot. Yes. Um, <laughs> just one. Just one. Um, I think I, because you've had so many professionals on here before, yeah. um, I, it's hard to pick one. What, what I would say and what I'd be really interested in is um, if you could find like a television presenter. Ah, okay. Because how do you become a television <laughs> presenter? You know, like okay. that would be quite interesting right. to understand the roots um, into that. So that that would be my recommendation. All right, cool. Mm. All right, well, again, as I said, it's been a pleasure. Thank you to have you on, and um, thank you for coming. Thank you, and thank you all for joining.